Hey everybody, today I'm going to be talking about my top 10 film scores from the last decade. So that would be from 2010 to 2019. I get a lot of music questions from people and film scores are really kind of my my forte. So I figured I would I would do this one. Um, I haven't heard all of the music from films in the last decade, but I do have a lot of favorites that did stick out in my mind and the film scores just really stick with me kind of instantly when I hear them. So this really was not a hard list to make. The ones that did stick out really stuck out and I've, I've kept them in my mind and I've listened to them over time. And I'm really, really picky about music and really picky about film scores. Rarely in the modern era do they resonate with me, but a few do. There are specific uh, composers, modern composers, that I gravitate towards. And so you will see some repeat composers on this list and maybe some three-peats. But you know, it is my list so I can kind of do whatever I want. I'm gonna do what I normally do. I actually have 10 this time, 10 scores. I normally do like five movies or whatever, but this time it's 10. Um, they're in alphabetical order, but the final one will be the one that is my favorite because I do have one specific favorite over all of the rest and that's something typical that I do. But let's just get into it. Uh, the first score on this list would be A Ghost Story and that was composed by Daniel Hart. This is a very unexpected type of movie and I can imagine as a composer, if somebody presented this film to me or this idea, I think be a really a, a tough challenge because of how how tonally muddled it is all over the place and I don't mean that necessarily in, in a bad way um, there's just a lot going on I mean it's really hard to specify in terms of genre with this one I mean you might think it's horror based on on the the cover of it and just the title alone but it's not it, it's it, you know it's got a hint of the paranormal a hint of the philosophical um, in terms of feeling it is eerie but it's also meditative, very existential, but it has this feeling to it that is very wistful and nostalgic. Uh, it almost reminds me of like a Terrence Malick film in a lot of ways. How do you create a score that, that, that touches on all of those ideas? But Daniel Hart managed to do it above and beyond. And you know, when I saw the film, I instantly went and got, got the music for it. And I, I just think that it, it, the reason I return to it so often is just because of how, how mature it is. He, he really creates a very haunting, very delicate, uh, moving score that to me embodies everything that the film stands for in the most tangible way. To be quite honest, the score is far greater than the film, at least in my opinion. I, I, I don't really have that much of a desire to visit, revisit the film at all, but I constantly return to the score itself. And I did say it reminds me of a Terrence Malick film, but also even in the music there is that quality, strangely, where it feels like almost each chord is is like a breath you capture in your hand before it, it dissolves, it goes away. It feels personal and, and it gives the movie so much emotional richness and it's capturing how fleeting life can be, um, but also the weight of knowing that life changes and it will eventually end. So that the memory of it, like I said, the wistful, the kind of nostalgic quality of it is, is really uh, deeply resonant. It is a very melancholy soundtrack, which does fit the, the, the palette of the film, which is quite gray, but it is so deeply atmospheric. I think one of my favorite tracks in the film is Viventus and Im, which you know has this beautiful solo vocal uh, accompanied by these beautiful strings. And it has a, a more old fashioned style to it, that particular track. But then, like I said, it's touching on all kinds of different ideas and even musical genres. And I really like its use of electronic instruments and that kind of new agey sound as well. So he's not, Hart is not afraid to incorporate a lot of different sounds together. And somehow they do really make a harmonious blend. So this is a score. I highly recommend. Next, I'm going with the film Jackie with music composed by Mika Levy. And I actually have two scores by her on this list and it's it's tough, they're, they're quite different from each other. So I don't know which one I prefer, but they're equally uh, compelling and equally emotionally potent. I think that that's Levy's strength as a composer is, is capturing um, internal emotion. I think she really has a comprehension of, yeah, just like the inner mechanisms of the brain and how to bring out those intimate emotions that we we often feel but we can never say out loud. It's almost like she can take a singular emotion and then a conflicting emotion within and she can somehow convert those into these long, very warped chords that they seem very simple. 
uh, the compositions just in general, but you feel so many layers within it, and it, it, that's the genius part of it. The film does follow Jackie, uh, Jackie Onassis, wherever she goes, and I, I didn't particularly care for the film. It felt too um, emotionally removed from Jackie just in terms of her persona and the person as well. But I think, honestly, I think that Levy's score is, it, it filled in all of the blanks and it did all of the heavy lifting, unfortunately. It gave the film depth and dimension where I thought that it was sorely lacking. I, that score deserved a better film. So they, I think they were so lucky to have her. The score is just giving us more dimension uh, than either the script or Natalie Portman's performance. There is something that is very, regal about the sound, I guess. Um, it has a very, an Amer like an American sound to it, or like a touch of that, that you can sort of sense. There's something very pensive and melancholy as well, uh, and elegant, yet deeply fragile and full of despair. And all of these things capture the, the inner workings of, of Jackie's mind as she's you know, talking about her husband's death. I really didn't expect a score like this from Levy after Under the Skin, but she really surprised me with her range and being able to explore different aesthetics and more importantly, um, bringing that internal color out. And she does it better than almost anybody working in, in at least film composition today. Next, I'm going with Cresha, and this is a score that was written by, I think, Brian McComber is how you say the name. I was quite taken with the film originally when I, I saw it, uh, but I was more drawn to the idea behind it. The idea of this, this no-name director, this young guy, Trey Edward Schultz, and he's just this guy from Houston, and he wanted to make his first movie, but not really having much of a budget, he did it in his family home, and it stars his actual family, using the resources available to him on a very, very low budget, and making something really personal and special out of it. So much of the power of that film is is in the aesthetic that is that is painting the portrait of this woman's psychological descent. So yeah, the editing is very strong. It's very kinetic. It, there's a lot of movement. It feels very cinematic, even though it is just taking place in this guy's home. And because it is taking place in one day and and the protagonist, the 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 heroine of of the film, we don't know much about her. There's not a lot of backstory, but we're just seeing her psychologically unraveling um, little by little. So because she has no backstory, a lot of the outer textures and all of that have to reflect that psychological unraveling for us to be convinced by it. So the score does have this very buzzy sort of manic quality to it. And it is very uh, complex because it's very playful in some ways, but it's also very eccentric and plucky and percussive. And those are typically my favorite parts of the score, uh, just because it, there's something, there's like a, a nervousness to it. Uh, it captures this very off kilter feeling and the rhythm of it and the way that people move within the frame and the space in relation to Krisha, who is the main character, we're seeing from her point of view, it makes everything more engaging. And it does very unusual things, the music does, where it, it sounds like they're using like piano keys and, and strings from inside the piano that they're plucking and some cool, uh, very tribal instruments getting incorporated. And it gives you a feeling of, yeah, something very foreign that you wouldn't expect when it's coming from a, a suburban house in Houston. Uh, and it gives you that uneasy feeling of like what Cretia's feeling where she's observing all of these people that she feels so removed from. But when the music needs to, it becomes more um, uh, focused and minimal to let the emotions itself be the highlights of the scene. And even in the opening of it, you can tell it's, it's certainly borrowing from a lot of horror film classics. There's maybe a little bit of Bernard Herrmann in there and, and The Shining as well. Um, but it's not, it's, it's not overplayed. Just in the moments when it feels necessary. But overall, it's a score that I was always really intrigued by. And I, I yeah, I, I found it quite unique, though it is rarely talked about, and this film is rarely talked about, but you know, I think it's certainly worth your time. Next, I'm talking about The Master, and this was composed by Johnny Greenwood, and I remember being so excited when this film came out and really excited about the score, just because Johnny Greenwood working with Paul Thomas Anderson uh, after There Will Be Blood 
I went nuts for that. That That is one of my favorite film scores of all time. PTA and Greenwood working together to me is one of the great collaborative teams in Hollywood, perhaps the greatest collaboration between director and composer as far as I'm concerned, at least in, in the modern day. And when you listen to this score, it does certainly feel like Johnny Greenwood. It, you know, it, it has his signature style. And with him, he's a very curious kind of person. And he's, you know, yearning to experiment and, and play with all of these postmodern kind of 20th century sounds. But instrumentally and compositionally, it is more ambitious than There Will Be Blood, I would say. It, this reminds me a little bit more of like Bartok or like Terry Riley, incorporating more than just strings and piano. Um, he's doing more woodwinds. It does, when you listen to the music, I don't know, it has an almost off-color feel to it. And it does feel very mid-century. It's like... Yeah, it's like you're living in that feeling of the 1950s, this aged technicolor, that the madness and the seething anger and insanity that is simmering from underneath this this culture and it's particularly within these characters themselves. And you're really bringing all that out, accenting it with this very modern, very bizarre type of music. It is colorful, but in an off sort of way and it's eerie. It feels almost like an Edward Hopper painting. What I love about Greenwood, and I will talk more about him as, as the list progresses, he, the thing that the connective tissue with all of his work it, for me is that never once does his, do his scores give you any easy answers, uh, any easy sen sentiment. It's its own thing. It's its own sort of experience that inhabits so many spaces and feelings, and it has a strange and surreal feel to it. It is so easy for scores to be the catalyst for the emotion, and often it can force the emotion unfairly, even in the really good ones. It's such a fine line between capturing the nuance and, and the feeling, the authenticity of what's going on, but not forcing us and trying to tell us what we should be feeling. I never felt that with, with Greenwood scores, unless he's kind of being cheeky or um, it's a sort of um, an intentional, self-aware sort of thing. And I can't, honestly, I, I can't say that about even some of the great film composers. So I think Greenwood is, is, is so special. Next, I'm talking about Moonlight and the music for this was composed by Nicholas Bertel. I haven't seen the film in a really long time, but I remember being very struck by it and thinking that it was a really an incredible coming of age story that it has an immediacy to it and it, it feels as if you're experiencing everything that this young boy is going through and each stage of his life very beat for beat as if it's from his own mind his point of view and so the music really has to reflect that the film is extremely cinematic and it feels quite all-encompassing so the music as well feels as though it's like it's engulfing you into this world i really like the wispy feeling to the strings especially in the melodic sections of the score um, it feels very airy and very delicate because it's reflecting the fragility of the main character um, and the intimacy of his feelings as he evolved because he is so um, almost taciturn, very shy. It's a very sensory experience listening to the music and, and as the emotions of the character fluctuate you can feel that rise and fall in the tension of the music. A lot of ambient kind of drones give it that resonance when the emotion is running high. I love one particular part, I guess you would call it the climax of the film, and where you have like this metronome sort of sound. I don't know if it is a metronome, but it sounds like it. And it sounds like an orchestra tuning and, and the emotions are swelling and rising. He is growing as the soundscape seems to be expanding itself. And it really helps give, give the film that, that color and that cinematic quality. And it's already such a visually striking film and so many elements of the film blend so harmoniously. And, and really the score is just one aspect of that. But I think that it, it really communicates those visuals in a very haunting way. It's very mature. I loved the score from the moment that I saw the film and like many other scores on this list, I've, I've, I've re-listened to it many, many times. Next, I'm going with The Social Network, and this was composed by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. This is another score that involves a, a, a popular musician from an iconic band, uh, but Reznor working with Atticus Ross and then in collaboration with David Fincher is also one of the great revolution or re revelations uh, in the last decade for sure. Because behind every auteur filmmaker, there's usually I mean, he or she will pick a composer to do the majority of the work if they find one that they really like. And Atticus Ross and Fincher and Sorkin, just all of them together, it, it is just one of the great collaborations. They blend like peanut butter and jelly. 
It's ridiculous. And it's one of those things where you wouldn't necessarily think about it, but as soon as you see it, you're like, oh, why didn't I think of this? But the music uh, of Nine Inch Nails has a quality to it where you can sense that compositionally he could transition to film scores quite easily. Because Nine Inch Nails al albums are inherently very cinematic. There are certain moments, and Downward Spiral in particular, uh, that remind me very much of The Social Network, even melodically. But of course, Social Network is much more subtle of an experience musically. It's meant to be, of course, the backdrop rather than the focal point. It really represents the modern day in a way that combines kind of a strong feeling of, of vulnerability and isolation while also having that feeling of being quite removed and quite cold and distant. Even sterile, I'll go so far as to say. And we see that a lot in film scores nowadays, I think in huge part because of the success of this particular one. But out of a lot of those, I don't think many of those collaborative efforts are so harmonious like they are in this one. I feel like the main theme has everything you could you could want. The melody is so, so simple. Uh, but there's an uneasiness to the textures that are coming out underneath, but it never overpowers it. The layering of everything is very specific, but it all works together in a very balanced way. And it is essentially the framework for that core emotion seeping through the main character, Mark Zuckerberg. As I said before, when you see the collaboration with Fincher and, and Ross and, and Reznor, it's like, why didn't I think of this before? Because that digital edge, that minimalism of the score is just perfect for somebody like Fincher, whose films also have that kind of quality. They, they're they kind of dabbling more in the modern era, having that edge with those little digital touches that give it that, that coldness. But at the same time, he's also rooted in um, an era that is traditionally very cinematic. They have since done many uh, collaborations and all of them I think have been really interesting. One of my favorites being Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Um, I'm not a big fan of the film, but the score I love. But for me, I think you're getting the best overall quality uh, with this particular one. And it is maybe the most cohesive overall. And like I said, it really did set the tone for a lot of electronic scores of its type to kind of continue this trend more and more. It, it's not, you know, it wasn't the inception of that, but it certainly uh, helped with it. But yeah, this one, it, it does it better than most. Next, I'm going with uh, Uncut Gems, and it is composed by, I don't know how to say the name, but it's like Daniel Lopatin, Lopatin? I don't know, sorry, but I, I love this score so much. And I, I actually saw the film not that long ago, so this one is still quite fresh in my mind. But I love this guy's collaboration with the Safdie brothers, and I hope that they, they stick with him, because I think he has a, he gives a definite flavor to the films, and the films do have a, a definite flavor to them. I think the Safdie brothers have a talent for, uh, you know, the finer details and world building. And I feel like the composer here is really capturing that style, but enhancing a lot of that uniqueness. And this is another example, I think, of having some filmmakers who are just, they are so lucky to have a, a composer like this. And I feel like a lot of the success of the film, though I don't mean that it doesn't stand on its own, doesn't have its own merit, it's it's hugely dependent on its on its score, and I think people it's kind of underrated. I don't think people quite recognize that, at least with this particular film. The music, you know, it's borrowing from so many musical genres and, and nostalgic genres, much like the film itself. The whole time the, I was watching the movie, the music was reminding me of Akira, and Akira is, of course, one of my favorite scores of all time. Uh, that one also includes a lot of elements that you wouldn't expect. It has that kind of late 70s, early 80s kind of synth vibes going on, a futurist style to it, but it's also so soulful and, and trans transcendent in the way that it's incorporating like the, the voices, that chorus and having those tribal instrumentation is so unexpected. And I feel like this, this score for Uncut Gems has a similar uh, synth soundscape, but it, it, it's building on it. There's a lot more kind of electronic touches and things like that. It also has choral, um, choral passages, voices, and that kind of opens it up and gives it that, that heart, that dimension. And it, for me, it's those voices that give it that pulsing uh, adrenaline, that driving emotion. But then there's also this whimsicality to it. It, it. it kind of sparkles and it feels almost cosmic. It's got kind of like a Blade Runner vibe going on as well, especially with like the saxophones and such. And it's new agey, which is giving the film um, a lot of that that uh, freshness and that energy. And it's just, it's pumping through the veins of the film 
the entire time. And for me, overall, the things I, I liked the most about Uncut Gems, even though it wasn't a film that I is necessarily for someone like me, I'd say, uh, a lot of what I appreciated about it was just the details. Uh, and I think that the score is of elevating a lot of those ideas and, and capitalizing on those. Give it a listen on its own and you realize it is extremely detailed and very versatile. And like I'm saying with a lot of these, these scores on this list, it's like they, they, they're giving you so much emotion, but ironically, they're not giving you the easy answers. And that's so difficult to do. And, you know, with this music, you'd think it might be really dark, but it isn't. You know, there's an irony to it. It's not deeply dark. It's not deeply sad music. It's fluctuating between all these different kinds of emotions, and it feels like it's kind of sputtering throughout the music, and that's why it feels so alive. When I think of the music for this, I think alive. Next, I'm gonna go with uh, another Mika Levy score, and this is for Under the Skin. If Greenwood, for me, is maybe the great film composer of, of, of this modern day, of my generation, I'd put Mika Levy like right underneath him. I, 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 in a way, they have sort of similar stories when you look at it. I know that she, she's classically trained, but you know she's also a songwriter, and they both have worked. They've they've done their time. They've worked in kind of you know having their bands. Like with her in particular, she's worked a little bit more in kind of like this experimental art pop genre. Not, of course, on the level of Johnny Greenwood with the success of Radiohead or anything like that, but I've, I've listened to her albums. Um, she's under the, the stage name Mikachu, so it's like Mikachu and the Shapes, uh, and it is, it's very interesting stylistically. I'm very drawn to it because it is very eccentric and quirky and plucky, though I'm more drawn to the aesthetic itself because uh, the music itself isn't always coming together for me be beyond a lot of the, the stylistic parts of it. it what I, I say this a lot when I watch a movie, but if I don't feel that there's like a strong core, I say there's like no tree trunk, there's no core trunk, there's just a lot of loose branches. And in a way when I listen to like the music, her popular music, that's how I feel about it. Or I should say like art pop experimental music. Um, but I think she's really found her calling with film scores. I think that this is something that she needs to keep doing. I was one of those people who did not care for Under the Skin overall. I'd like to return to it because maybe I might feel differently now. When it comes to Levy, she is giving, just like Jackie for this, I think she is really giving Under the skin its legs. It doesn't even really feel like a score. To be honest, it feels like just part of the diegetic world, um, just coming from all the sounds um, within the actual world itself, but 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 it's not. It's quite horrific sounding. It has like an atonal quality, but at other times it's very alluring and very sexy and almost always quite alien-like, quite removed from humanity, and it has kind of an exotic creature type of soundscape to it. More as though it belongs in, in a horror film that might have very grotesque imagery. I think of like Alien or something like that. But still, it, it finds the humanity as the crux of its emotion. And for me, my favorite track in the entire score is Love. Uh, it's a very simple piece of music, but I don't know, as soon as I heard it, like from the moment those first few seconds began and you hear the strings, I just thought, yes, this is love. When I listen to it, it it's bittersweet because it's like, it reminds me of my first time falling in love um, and that kind of bitterness. And you'd think when it's about love, it might have a, a joy to it, a happiness, but no, this isn't a happy piece of music. There is a real uh, darkness to it, a painfulness as though it, it's painful to relinquish that vulnerability, but it's a swelling feeling. But within that swell, it's like blooming and, and blossoming. Uh, or at least that's how it felt to me. And it, it feels almost like being able to realize that you have the ability to love after being so cold for so long, but also knowing that it could be over before it even uh, begins. And it's that painful combinations of emotions coming out of, of the sounds um, and the sting of it that really has always resonated with me strongly. Yeah, that's what I would say, actually. I think sting, that's a good word for her, for her music. It stings, but something about it that, that swells within you. Um, and that's a feeling that you're likely to never forget. And I, I love just how a lot of film composers are really taking music to the next level and they're really pushing it and in that sort of direction. And she's one of those people. Next, I am going with the film You Were Never Really Here. And the score is by Johnny Greenwood. And uh, yeah, I know I've got too many Johnny Greenwood scores on here, but um, he's quite simply my favorite composer working today, as I've already stated. And he seemed to come out of nowhere, it felt like. I mean, I always knew he was quite a musical aficionado, and, uh, you know, of course, from his years on Radiohead and all that. But then comes There Will Be Blood, 
and I was just so astounded by his versatility and his ability to adapt um, to different musical styles. With There Would Be Blood, there's like a kind of like a Pinderesky Ligeti influence going on there. The master, like I mentioned before, is more reminds me more of like Terry Riley and, and things of that nature. This one, you were never really here. Is he's taking more of that 20th century postmodern influence and really playing up the the electronic sounds uh, and it has some very interesting textures and and some of the most interesting instrumentation i've heard from him the variation in, in time signature and and like the layering of the instruments it's all it's all so trippy it's, it feels so psychedelic the layering of the electronic soundscapes and everything it may seem simple, again, like Mikalevi, it may seem simple, but when you really look at it, it is so sophisticated and so much time went into every little aspect of it. You can tell. I really love the film You Were Never Really Here. I should have reviewed it when it came out, but I, I didn't for whatever reason. But I, I find it to be just a very refreshing experience as a film because, you know, it's on paper, it's it's a thriller sort of thing. It's like, well, I've seen this so many times. Um, However, it, it's handled in a way that is so off kilter and it makes everything feel as though it's a film that you've never seen before, a story that you've never seen before. And that is a rarity. Yeah, and in the music, it does remind me of like the scores that he did, like, like There Will Be Blood as example. I think it has huge similarities to that. But again, with this heavy electronic influence, so those electronic aspects of it are what make it feel so psychedelic and it's it's warping the strings even more. And it's, it's just so exciting to listen to when I listen to this particular score, my ears are just so excited the entire time. They're always stimulated um, so much all at once. It's like Christmas morning. Always something complex and hypnotic, always something kind of ironic and, and something, um, one thing contrasting another or sometimes multiple things contrasting each other. And as usual, Greenwood just, he continues to amaze me. He's doing some of the most insightful compositions, the most interesting compositions in American film. And now we're gonna talk about my final score on the list, and this would be another Johnny Greenwood score, and it is uh, Phantom Thread. And this, the film, of course, is directed by Paul Thomas Anderson. And I, I genuinely think this, I saw the film when it came out, did review it, and I remember thinking this score is going to stand the test of time. At least I hope it does. It's. I think it's going to be remembered as one of the all-time greats. Here he isn't so dissonant and, and experimental as he is in, in some of his other scores, though I do think that this score certainly does have a very modern, very modern quality to it at times. But it's also so lush and so melodic and elegant, almost regal. Thinking about Phantom Thread as, as a film, it's such a weird experience because it seems on the surface to be just about, it's a love story between two people who meet and then they eventually become husband and wife and you're, you're essentially going through a lot of their ups and downs as a couple with them and it seems like a very typical story. But it's Paul Thomas Anderson, so there's something just kind of off about it. It has such a strangeness to it. Uh, it's weirdly funny and very odd at times, but tender as well, and then very dark. And sometimes all of these emotions on the spectrum you can feel in one scene between maybe two people. It's, it's, a, it's really unique, and how do you convey that musically? For me, Greenwood finds a way to make the film very, very romantic and lovely and memorable. But even with that, when you have like the House of Woodcock theme, for example, one of my favorite parts of the score, there's always like a little twinkle in the eye. It's like he gets the humor. It has a slightly cheeky quality to it. Yeah, there's a darkness to the score and it has touches of that edge that, that take us out of the time period. And so in that way, it certainly feels timeless and very edgy in, in other ways. But uh, I will say that in a weird way, the score reminds me of, of the score to Vertigo, Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo, written by the great Bernard Herrmann. And I say that because that score, you know, like the film is meant to kind of pull the rug out from under you about the halfway point of the movie. But before that, it is also very sweeping and romantic, but in a way that feels just so lush and so romantic, overly sentimental, it seems. And to the point of where it's like, you know they're conscious of what they're doing. Like Hitchcock is conscious of what he's doing so that he can pull the rug out from under you in the second half. And Herman, I think, might have that same 
thing going on there as well. You know, he's conscious of how he's manipulating you. And Greenwood is as well, I think. It has that richness and all of that. It's very multifaceted. And I, I remember thinking, honestly, when I was in the theater, like, are you serious? Like, really? This is the score? This is unbelievable. And no one's gonna top this. To me, this is like almost on the level of a Bernard Herrmann score or on the level of a Nino Rota score for like Fellini or something like that. Those are some of my favorite film composers of all time. And I think that he... He's got that. He keeps surprising me more and more and more than any other composer. Of anything, this was the last kind of score I would have expected from him. So I, I can't say enough good things about him. I think he's incredible. And all of the scores on this list, I think, are really, really worth your time. I say watch the films if you haven't seen them. And then listen to the, the scores separately so you can really give them the attention that they deserve and really respect them for what they are. Like I say, film, you know, doing a film score is so difficult. It is so hard not to give us all the answers and give us all that sentiment as so many film scores do, but these are, are somehow kind of beyond that and able to convey something on their own, almost like they are um, their own character in the film. But anyway, yeah, I, I really love, um, you know, music and music history and, and, and film scores in particular. So I really enjoy doing this. Uh, let me know um, some scores that I should listen to if I haven't and some of your favorites as well. And that is my video. Thank you all for listening. All my social media information is below. You can watch more videos here and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.